afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Singe 15. We are going to dive into stuff here pretty soon. Um, I did want to make a couple of quick um, announcements uh, regarding mostly the um, homeworks um, that we've got posted. So homework two is available, um, and we've already covered the things that we would need to do problems one, two, and three on there. Four and five, we're starting that today, and we'll finish it up on Monday, and then you'll have the rest of the week next week through like Friday at midnight um, to handle the, the remaining ones on there. Um, there are two, well, I guess one's a typo and one, you could see it as a typo, but it's just I forgot and left something out. Um, so let me switch over there really quick. Uh, if you go into homework two up at the top, um, there are two corrections that I've made. Um, one probably hasn't been a problem yet uh, because problem 2.5, my guess is you haven't gotten to there yet, but it's okay. It still had a typo. The formula inside the sine and the cosine should be that and not what it is on the actual assignment. Although I believe I have updated the assignment. So if you go download it now, it'll say the right thing. Um, also problem 2.2, uh, I was supposed to also add the requirement that you set the um, plot title to update like it did in homework one. Remember we used the concatenation and all that good stuff to make a, a plot title change to, to whatever it is we needed it to. That was supposed to be part of problem 2.2 as well, um, so I added that terminology in there. There's also one thing that, um, oh yeah, I guess we'll come back to homework two in a minute, but also homework one's um, solutions have been posted, so if you want to see how I did some of those things, um, you can download uh, the solutions from our Canvas page at the top of the um, Homework 1 page. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about Homework 2, which I haven't written on here anywhere, but maybe I will update it in a little bit, um, it will help you a lot in your uh, sort of debugging and your development of those code, of that code, if you add something to the beginning of your script. Um, and so let's switch over to MATLAB really quick and I'll show you what that um, looks like. Um, let me dig up the homeworks. We'll just do an example of, say, uh, sure, problem 2.2, since it's there. What I suggest that you do um, in these homeworks is the very first part of your um, code, right up even above the comment that's there, type the word clear and leave that there. Um, if you type the word clear, you'll see the pop-up box. The little tooltip will pop up and it says, what clear does is remove items from the workspace. That's a good idea when you're first working with scripts, because if you run through the script and then make a change and then try to run through the script again, depending on the change that you've made, those it might be over in the workspace still, um, a, a variable that was changed from a previous run. And that can get confusing because it can look like things are sort of lagging behind, um, like you have to run it twice in order to get the correct um, display or something like that. Clearing your variables will ensure that you've got everything structured the right way um, and not in a way that works some of the time but not all of the time. Um, clear will ensure that it will work in the way that the code is written exactly on your page um, every time. Along those same lines of, of making sure the code works, and part of the reason for adding the word clear in there, the command clear, is that most of these problems I've subdivided for you into parts, like part A, part B, and part C. Those are there to try to guide your development of that code, um, to start from a simple code base and then build upon it as you add sort of bells and whistles and different functionality and stuff like that. That doesn't mean that that's the way that the code actually gets built when you look at it when you're all done. So it's not that you'll have a chunk for part A and then underneath it more code for part B and then underneath that more code for part C. It may be that the code for part C has to go to the top of your script. Um, and in fact, most likely for this one, when you create these three numeric sliders, those are in fact going to have to be fairly high up in your code because remember it runs, MATLAB will evaluate code first from right to left, but also from top to bottom. So it you have to have those numeric sliders in this example fairly early because you're going to do calculations based on them later. So the A, B, and C is to sort of guide your development of the code. It's not necessarily chunks of code in that exact order. So some of that code will have to appear in, in different locations. Um, again, all of which is 
uh, helped by using the word clear up at the top of each one of your scripts. Um, that will wipe out any of the workspace variables from previous runs of that code, and it'll ensure you always start fresh um, on each one. So put the word clear up there, um, and that'll, that'll help out. Um, what we want to do today is talk about two really important topics for all of the remaining simulations that we have. Uh, and those two topics are indexing and iteration. And we're going to introduce iteration as sort of a logical extension of the types of things that we might use indexing for. Um, and so we'll get to that a little bit later today. Uh, so to start that discussion, um, let's give ourselves a new um, live script. So I'll come over here into Lecture 8. Uh, we'll go into Live Editor, and we'll say, give me a new live script, and I'll close that last one there. I'm also going to turn this into up, down, and keep my workspace fairly small since we need a, a bit of space here um, to work. And let's save this too so that I don't lose it. So the topic of the day, at least here, uh, is indexing. Let me zoom in a little bit so that you can see the indexing. We've already done indexing. So we did indexing over in um, Excel. When we did indexing in Excel, the way that we interpreted that command, that index function, was that we would give it a vector and say, go look in this vector somewhere. This is the vector that I'm talking about. And then from that vector, count down a certain number of rows, or if it was a horizontal vector, it could be this number of columns to a particular location in there, and we call that the index of that vector. Um, the indices are sort of always there. We don't always have to define them. They just exist. Uh, and then return whatever the value is. That sort of indexing can also be done in MATLAB. What I think is challenging with the indexing in MATLAB is that unlike Excel, it can also go the other direction. So in MATLAB, you can say something like, go find the, I don't know, fourth position in X, and overwrite the value that's there, right? Put a particular number in that position. And it's that combination of being able to both read out of a variable and write into a variable with essentially the same syntax that I think can make indexing pretty confusing. Um, and also just the idea of this number that's sort of moving around and pointing to different locations in a variable. Um, if you've never seen it before, that it, it's hard to visualize exactly what it's doing. And that's why we spent so much time on it in Excel, to try to give you that baseline understanding of what does it mean to index into something. It means go look at the variable, count along to a particular location, and then read out whatever the value is there. Um, and so that, that's the same as what we can do in MATLAB, it's just that there's two ways to do it. So let's talk about the two different ways to do that. Two ways to use indexing. The first way, and it's all set based on where the, the equal sign is. So if the indexing occurs on the right side of the equal sign, it means the following. It, it means a couple of things. We're, we're going to try to talk about exactly what that means in each time. In words, what does it mean if, if something is on, if the indexing is on the right-hand side of the equal sign? What it means um, is that I want you to go into the variable x. Let's assume that we're dealing with the variable x. Um, find position idx. In other words, find the index that you want. So like a 1 or a 2 or a 3 or however many there are. Um, and then tell me what the number is there. That's what it means whenever you see indexing on the right-hand side of the equal sign, that's what it's doing. It's going into that vector to that particular location and telling me what the number is. We can do it to matrices too, and then you just have to specify a row and a column because it's two-dimensional. What this would look like in code is something like blah, blah, blah over on the left. Uh, we, we don't really care what's happening on the right, or on the left, I mean. Over on the right-hand side, you'll see something that looks like x of idx. That's how we specify um, indexing in MATLAB. So when you see x uh, parenthesis idx parenthesis, it may not literally be the word id, the letters idx. We can use other variables for indices. Um, but since we were using idx a lot over in um, Excel, we're going to start with idx here. That's the syntax for indexing. You give it the variable and then say, here's the position that I want you to go to. So the parentheses uh, denote indexing. For example, the fourth element of x, 
uh, is read as x of 4. Right, the third element is x of 3, sixth element is x of 6, etc., etc. Um, that is the, the syntax for indexing. Um, and this is actually what we were doing in Excel. But in Excel, um, we were doing it with a different function, right? In Excel, we were saying equals index, and then we would give it the vector x and tell it, go find the index that way. So it's similar, but I, I would argue it's a little bit easier to read, um, especially once you get used to the syntax of, oh, x of 4 means go index into x and get the fourth element, rather than having to type out this kind of clunky equals index and then you give it arguments and, and that sort of stuff um, in Excel. It's doable in Excel and it's doing exactly the same thing that we can do in MATLAB. It's just the, in the interaction with it is a little bit different, right? The syntax is a little bit different. The other thing that we can do uh, happens if the indexing occurs on the left-hand side of the equals. Um, and this is not something that we can do I mean, technically, you can do it in Excel, but it's really ugly if you try to do it in um, Excel. I'm not sure if there's a built-in way to do it in Excel. So if the indexing occurs not on the right, but on the left side of the equal sign, this has a different meaning. And we use it for different things, um, since it has uh, different meanings. The meaning of this in words, when you see something written like that, uh, is along the lines of go into x, uh, find position id x, wherever that, whatever id x is. And unlike what we did in MATLAB, or in um, Excel, and what we can do with indexing on the right-hand side in MATLAB, um, we're not reading what the number is, we're going to put a number there. So go into x, find position x, and put this number there. That's new. No, that's not something that we were able to do in um, Excel. But the syntax looks very similar if we want to do that in MATLAB. The difference is that the indexing operation shows up on the left-hand side of the equal sign, something like this. It's the same syntax, though, right? It's just where did it show up in that command on that line of code. Um, and that can make it a little bit confusing as you're first starting off with indexing because it looks like you're trying to do the same thing. It's like you're reading a value and setting it equal to another value. Are you comparing them? What are you doing? It, you're doing two fundamentally different things. If it's happening on the right-hand side, you're reading. If it's happening on the left-hand side, you're kind of writing, right? You're putting values um, into there. So as an example, um, if we wanted to put uh, the number 63 into x, right? Maybe we wanted to put it into the third place in x. So put uh, the number 63 uh, into the third place in x. If we wanted to do something like that, what this would look like is uh, x of 3 is equal to 63. Remember, code runs from right to left first, right? It goes right to left and then top to bottom. So the first thing a line like x of 3 is equal to 63 is interpreted as the 63 on the right-hand side gets checked first. It's just a number, so it's, there's not really any checking that it has to do. Then MATLAB interprets the equal sign as take that number 63 and put it over here, assign it to whatever's on the left-hand side. What are we assigning it to? The third location in X. Um, and so that's what the writing operation looks like um, in indexing. There are some similarities uh, that are the, that are shared between indexing either on the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the equal sign. And there are also similarities that are the reason why in that email that I sent out earlier today, I said indexing is straightforward, but I would not call it easy. The reason it's straightforward is it does have some fixed rules that uh, some of them can be bent, but for the most part, we're just going to follow these rules without exception. Um, when they get bent or broken, sometimes weird things happen. But um, for the most part, all of these uh, indexing operations that we're going to do will follow these rules. And that helps because that gives you a, a rule structure that you can look to to say, what kind of code do I need to write in order to produce a desired effect? Or if I'm getting a weird effect, which one of these rules might I be not applying correctly? So in both of these cases, there are a few things um, to keep in mind. So let's uh, sort of enumerate uh, what's being kept in mind. 
first and foremost is that the variable um, being indexed into, or I should say being accessed or indexed into, um, must exist. That sounds maybe a little bit weird, but essentially what it means, or maybe not even weird, just kind of self-evident. What it means is if I try to do a command like this, x of index, um, if x doesn't exist, I'm going to get an error. I point that out because that's not strictly the case in Excel. When we were using this sort of syntax in Excel to introduce ourselves to indexing, we didn't actually specify a variable. We just specified a range over which to look. Um, and there were some weird ways that we could sort of get that range to go outside of the data that we wanted if we weren't careful about how we did the autofill in the cells. Um, but it has to exist. Uh, if, if you're going to index into something in MATLAB, the variable has to exist. I'm going to write that as sort of a rule for either way of indexing, whether you want to index as a read or index as a write. But we will bump into some situations where we can bend that rule a little bit. Um, just not right now. Um, the indices must be integers. So they have to be things like one, two, three, dot, 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 all the way up to however many elements um, are in that particular vector. Um, and that's actually the third one, is not only must they be indices, or, or sorry, um, integers, uh, indices must uh, be greater than one, or I should say greater than zero, i.e. they start at one. Right, that's the lowest that it can be. There is no zeroth element. There's only the first element and then the second. And not only must they be greater than zero, but they also have to be uh, less than or equal to uh, the number of elements in the variable itself. So if my x has 10 uh, elements to it, I can't go any lower than one. I can't go any higher than 10. If I try to do either one of those, I will usually get an error. Um, Again, there are some times where we can bend that rule, but as far as we're concerned, to get us started, we're going to treat that rule as fairly ironclad so that we don't have to make modifications to it um, as we go. So these are the rules of indexing um, inside of, of MATLAB. Um, we're going to look at an example, um, and we're going to look at a couple of different elements uh, to this example, and we're going to build it up in maybe a non-intuitive way to get started, um, but I want to try to be as clear as possible with what is MATLAB actually doing, because eventually we're going to clean all this up and make it look the way that it would normally look when we wanted to code an iteration, for example, um, and it's important to know what it's doing underneath the hood when it does that, so bear with me. It's, it's here for a good reason, so that you can see it all laid out once. Um, before we get to the more compact versions. So what we want to do, remember we usually start with um, some kind of a problem statement, um, is we would like to plot y is equal to x squared. So that's fairly um, basic kind of operation. How we did this before, like if you were taking the information from our last lectures and you wanted to plot y is equal to x squared. Well, the way that we would do that is first we would define all the points of x at which we would like to evaluate y. So it might be something like 0, 10, 20, 30. I'm going to do that because it's easy. We can start with just four of them. Uh, but it could have been something like lin space of x min to x max. Um, or it could have been something like x min colon dx colon x max. I remember we haven't really used the colon operator too much, but it, it was there. It was another way of generating sort of a, a set of data that went from x min to x max in fixed chunks. Whereas linspace says go to x min to x max and do it in whatever chunk you need so that the end result has 50 steps or 100 steps or, or something like that. And then what we would do, again previously, is we would use element-wise operation So here we've got an element-wise operator of the power um, function. We would use an element-wise operator to say, MATLAB, go into x and take each element there, square it, and store the result over in y. And then if we wanted to plot it, we would say something like plot x, y. Remember, when we plot something, x and y have to have the same number of um, elements. And then if we were to run that and look at our plot, 
This is about the only time that we're going to look at our plot today. Sure enough, we get the plot that we want, and we would go in and annotate it and stuff like that. It's a little bit of a chunky plot right now because it starts, it has, it's only got four data points on it, right? It goes from here to here to here. Um, so we could add more data points to smooth it out, but we're less interested in what the plot looks like right now um, and more interested in what it is we're doing. So I'm going to comment out the plot here and shut it up so that we don't see it um, every single time. That's how we did it before. Now let's do the same thing, um, but let's do it with indexing. How would we do exactly the same thing, but with indexing? Well, part of it starts off the same. So we would still start off with x. So we still define that as whatever it is, wherever we want to evaluate um, the values of y, which in this case is the, the square of x. Right away, we have to do something that's a little bit different, and that's because of the first rule in indexing. The variable being accessed or indexed into must exist. So before we can start indexing stuff, let's make sure that both of the variables exist. X is OK because it's here, but Y doesn't exist yet. Let's ignore for the fact that it was generated in line 2. So we have to create Y. Usually, the creation of Y at this step is only intended to do two things. One, make sure y exists so that we can index to it. Two, if we're going to plot it, we know y has to have the same number of elements as x because that's a requirement for plotting. So often one of the things that we will do to get us started is just fill in y with a bunch of zeros. Enough zeros so that it's the same shape as x, right? It's got the same number of um, elements in it. If x is a row vector as it is here, then y is a row vector. Um, if it's a column vector, it's a column vector. If it's a matrix, it's a matrix, whatever. This step is called pre-allocation. So it's just generating some sort of dummy data that will stand in for the values of y uh, so that we can index into them um, at some later point. So this is a, a key step that we have to do a lot of the times whenever we're going to do indexing which is called pre-allocation. It just builds up some, some dummy data. Then we're going to start with the first value. The first value of x is at position 1. So how do we get that? We would say something like the current value of x, which is just the one that we're currently going to work on, is x of 1. And remember, the way to interpret this is the way that I kind of put it in quotes up here at the top. It means go into x, find the position idx, tell me what the number is there. We've gone one step further, um, which is that, yes, the right-hand side says go into x, get the value at the first location. Uh, but then what we did on the left-hand side is say once we've got that value, assign it to this new variable that we call current value of x. Um, that's a little, we, we haven't mentioned that before, but we have done that several times. Uh, in fact, it is exactly what we are doing. Uh, whenever we do a command like this, we're saying take a bunch of zeros and make those as y. Take the pattern 0, 10, 20, 30 and make that x. We have actually done that before. Here we're just creating a new variable um, so that we can do that. So what we would say here is go get the first value in x. That's what we're doing with a command like that. Store it, and we are then storing it in this new variable. Store it in current value of x. Notice we didn't remove the value of x. Sometimes we use language that says something like, go into x and extract the first value of x. We're not actually taking it out of x, right? We're just going in and reading it from x and storing the result of that read over in current value of x. Then we can do the math that we needed to do. So the calculated value of y is just equal to the current value of x, and then we square it. So this is our math, or more generally, an analysis, right? Some process, some algorithm, some procedure, whatever we're doing, right? It, it might not necessarily be math. It could be something else that's not math. Uh, but here we're doing math because we're just trying to square. Um, the x value. Now we want to take that value and insert it into the corresponding location in y. When, remember, when we're creating a plot, there's a conceptual link between the first element of x and the first element of y, and the eighth element of x and the eighth element of y, and so we need to maintain that correlation between the two. 
Now we use the other kind of indexing, which is indexing on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we would say y of 1 is equal to the calculated value of y. And the way that we would read this is put the value 0. And remember, 0 is the thing that we have, which is 0 squared, right? We went in there and calculated 0 squared um, into the first position of y. So a little bit, I, I would not, uh, I, would, I would agree with you if you read something like that, and you're like, that looks a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Initially, I agree with you, um, but I'm doing that on purpose so that we can sort of build up how Excel or how MATLAB does something here. So bear with me because I know that looks a little bit different. If we go ahead and run the script here, don't forget the workspace you can always double click on your variables to see what they look like um, after you run your your um, script and we're going to look at ways that you can see what they look like as you're running your script on monday um, which gives you a little bit more information about what's going on we don't see any kind of a difference in y right now because the first value was zero but it was already zero so it doesn't appear to have changed anything so let's go on to the second one a lot of the concepts here are the same this is why we're doing it this particular way. When we go to the second one, so now do the second position, what are some of the things that change? Primarily, it's the indices that change. So now I want to change the current value of x. Instead of reading the first value, I want it to be the second value. So I change that index to be 2. Um, and so what this says is pretty similar, right? Instead of go and get the first value of x, it's go and get the second value of x. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, it's the same idea, right? You've just sort of slid your access window along by one um, so that you can go see it somewhere else. Similarly, I want to update the indexing here for um, storing the calculated value of y because now I need to move that down by one um, as well. And so the result here will be that we put the value of 100, which we would expect 100 because that's the um, calculated value of 10 squared, uh, and now we are putting that into the second position of y. The key point of what I just did in terms of the copy-paste is two things. A, the indices change, right? We went from x of 1 and y of 1. Now we're talking about the second position, so both of those indices changed because we have a conceptual link between them. The other thing is what's interesting that it didn't change, um, and what didn't change is the math, right? Here, the sort of script or the code that we wrote to actually do the calculation do the math did not change at all we can copy that copy paste that down from one to the other and that's the power of both index indexing and what as we will see in a moment iteration the actual analysis the math that you do can be generalized in such a way that you can just write it once even though here we're going to write it four times um, so that we can see it but it's important to note that the actual calculation of the squaring function that we needed to do didn't change um, as we did this. You can probably guess what's going to happen uh, for the third and the fourth location. Um, let's just check really quick that the second one worked. So I just ran my script. Let's go look at y. And sure enough, the second element is 100. The third and the fourth elements haven't been updated yet because we haven't added that code. But as I said, you can probably guess what's going to happen. Uh, so we update this to the third position. Really all we have to do is change the index here to 3 and this one to 3. Um, but let's go ahead and change the, our comments too, so that if you're looking at this, you'll know what they are. And let's see, 20 squared is 400. And we're going to put that into the third position of y. Um, and similarly, the fourth position pretty much just looks the same. So we change this to fourth position. We change our two indices um, to four. And we just change a couple of our comments. Get the fourth value of x, do some math. And then the value we're squaring here is 30, uh, which should give us a value of uh, 900. And we're putting that, again, into the fourth position of y. And if I run that and I look in my workspace, uh, at y, sure enough, I've got 100, 400, and 900, which is exactly what I was expecting. But again, keep in mind, 
some things did not change, right? The math that we did on 9, 14, 19, and 24, those lines, it's exactly the same thing. It's not just conceptually the same thing. We did not have to alter that code at all. It is performing exactly the same type of calculation. The thing that's changing is the number on which we are performing that calculation. And of course the answer, the answer is different too. And the way that we keep that um, changing to sort of walk our way through X is by changing the indices, right? We go from one to two to three to four, and we step our way through until we've covered all of the values um, in X. And they get stored uh, at their corresponding locations. The reason they get stored at their corresponding locations is because typically there is some sort of a conceptual link between those two points. Sometimes it's plotting, which is what we're doing here. Sometimes it's other stuff. Uh, it just depends on what it is you're, you're trying to do. But as I mentioned a minute ago, I, I would fully understand if you look at something like that and you say, like, that, that cannot be the best way to do that. Like, that is an awful lot of typing, and there are an awful lot of places where we can make a mistake. Um, surely that can't be the only way. It's not, and we rarely write something out like that. Uh, in fact, most of the time when we write something out like that, it is to learn what's happening inside of a function somewhere. Um, and then as soon as we figure it out, we immediately stop writing like that because it's kind of annoying. Uh, but there are a number of things we can do to clean this up. number of things we can do to clean this up. We're going to build up three and then another three afterwards. Three are key, and then the other three are just sort of style points. So the first thing that we can do is remove some variables. There is no need for uh, each of these steps to happen separately. Um, you can see that the current value of x that we have here, the only thing that happens to that is it comes over here and gets squared, and then we never use it again. And similarly, so this one sort of goes down into here. Similarly, the calculated value of y, we only do one thing with that calculated value of y, which is we bring it over here and assign it into y. Other than that, we don't use those variables. Um, and so you can kind of envision this as, well, if those are the only two places I'm doing those, I could almost take these two equations, or these two lines of code, add them together, and the calculated values of y would c cancel out on either side. We do not do math like that. I'm trying to give you an, a, a sort of interpretation of what we're doing. But at any rate, what we're doing is something that doesn't really require that extra variable, so we can get rid of it. So what would we do if we wanted to get rid of it? Well, we could start off the same, right? We'll still pre-allocate each time. Um, and we'll still start with the first value of x, which is at 1. But we don't have to have those separate. We can do it all in one go. So we can say something like y of 1 is equal to x of 1 and square that directly. So this is still getting the value of x at 1, squaring it, and then store the result in y at the first position. That is exactly the same as what we did before. We just got rid of the intermediate variables and did the calculation on the right and assigned the result on the left. Remember that MATLAB will always evaluate from right to left. Most languages do. So the first thing that it does is it goes in here and tries to find, in this case, it tries to find the first value of x, then it will square it, and then it will write the result into the first element of y. That's how we would interpret um, a line like that. Now we can do the other ones in pretty much the same way. Um, and here you can see that the code gets quite a bit more simplified, right? This is doing essentially the same thing, um, but it's doing it now with the second element, and then the third and the fourth only require us to change these indices in here. That's a pretty big improvement, right, over these you know 20 lines of code that we were doing up here. This is quite a bit easier to read. But it's not necessarily easier to understand, right? The understanding comes from knowing what it was doing, which is all of the stuff up here. It's easier to read it because it only takes four lines, and you can kind of pick out the pattern pretty quickly. But if you didn't know what it was doing, the pattern might not mean anything to you. And that's why we developed the pattern one step at a time in the, in the um, previous example. So this would be a lot faster. Um, and or I shouldn't say a lot faster, a lot easier to read. Understanding is a different thing, but if you take a look at y, you'll see we get the same result for y, which is exactly what we want. So 
that helps us. Right away, we've condensed our code um, a fair amount. The next thing that we can do is generalize. So I'm going to put that in uh, parentheses. What I mean by generalize is replace the 1, the 2, and the 3 with an indexing variable. So this is going to feel like we just took two steps forward and one step back. So what I'm going to do is copy this. And instead of a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4, we take a moment to recognize that the role of that 1, 2, and 3, and 4 is the same in every one of those lines. It is serving the role of an index variable, right? We're going into a particular location in that variable, either x or y, and we want to index into it, right? Either we read into that variable if it's x at a particular location, or we write into that variable if it's y, and we want to go into a particular location. So conceptually, we're doing the same thing in each one of those steps in the sense that we are using an indexing variable. You can call your indexing variables a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to use IDX because we've kind of been using IDX for a while. So we're going to delete each of these numbers and replace them with IDX. Remember, IDX is the indexing variable which has to range, in this case, from 1 to 4. We need to have IDX defined. So right now, if I try to run this script, there is no IDX, right? I get an error if I try to run this because MATLAB went into this line, and the first thing it did was it tried to evaluate X of IDX. But IDX doesn't exist, so it's saying, I have no idea what you mean. X is there. But there is nothing called IDX, right? It's an unrecognized function or variable. So we do have to define IDX in the same way that we have to define most things. And remember, code executes from top to bottom. So that definition has to occur before we want to use it. So we would say IDX is equal to 1 here. If we run that and then look at Y, you'll notice we get zeros everywhere because the index isn't changing. So we have to change the index at each step um, as we go. So after this one, we would say, OK, you've done that math. Now let IDX be 2. You've done that math. Let IDX be 3. And you've done this math. And now let IDX be 4. That seems like two steps back, right? We are one step back. Because we had this nice, compact little form here that only took us four lines. We, it didn't feel like we were sort of repeating ourselves a lot. This one, for whatever reason, we, we have made one simplification. And that simplification was that whenever we want to do the math, we have again recovered this idea that these math steps are identical. Right? It's not just that they're conceptually the same. It, when we were doing x of 1 and y of 1 and x of 2 and y of 2, those were conceptually the same. Now it's actually the same piece of code. You can just copy paste one line to the next. That was the benefit of doing um, this particular step. It did come at the cost of now we have to manually set IDX1, IDX2, IDX3, and IDX4. That sucks, right? That didn't help us very much, but it did help us in the sense that now the math is the same everywhere, which is also good for troubleshooting because if you get it right once, it'll be right all of the times because you can just copy paste the code. Um, the the corollary to that is if you get it wrong, it'll be wrong every single time. But you know, let's you know, let's think positive that we're not going to do that wrong. The reason we do that is so that we can use the last topic for today, um, which is iteration. So what we want to do uh, with iteration, this is the reason why we were building up, um, is use a for loop so that we only write the math once only write the math once. The syntax to a for loop, so generally you start with the same steps that we have up here um, that we've seen before. We define our x, we define our preallocation in the same way. The syntax for a for loop is you start with 4, and then you define your uh, indexing variable. So our indexing variable is idx, and we want it to be 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4. By the way, every time you do um, a for loop, as soon as you hit enter, you'll probably get an auto-completed end that goes on the bottom. That's required. Every for loop has to have an end keyword at the end of it. 
Notice this is doing something that we've seen before, right? This idx is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. That doesn't look anything different than what we've used for x up here. It's just used in a different way because it happens to be preceded by this keyword 4. So idx will still exist, but not quite in the same way that we've seen before. But idx is real. idx will really exist, but it will be built up one step at a time. It'll start with idx as 1, and then it'll go to idx as 2, and then dot, 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 in this case, all the way down to idx as 4. So the syntax looks similar to what we've used before, but the way that it's being used, because it's preceded by that 4 keyword, is a little bit different. The stuff that goes inside, we can copy-paste exactly what we had before. Um, and this is the, the advantage of using a for loop, is I only have to write that once. Um, and it will do exactly the same thing as it sort of ticks up through IDX um, and goes tick, 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 one, two, three, four, taking that first element, squaring it, writing it, second element, square, write, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, as it goes through. We can abbreviate this stuff even more, um, right? We can make it even shorter as we go. So for example, we can abbreviate the, f the indexing variable. So if you copy paste this code, right? We start off the same way. There's a faster way to write this, right? This has a particular pattern and we've seen that pattern before briefly. That pattern was the colon operator. We've we ge briefly introduced uh, last time the idea that we can use linspace to generate equally spaced data, or if we know where we start and where we stop and what the increment is between each one, we can use the colon operator. And so we know here when we're defining this index, and this is usually the case when you're doing a for loop, we generally just want to count from one up to something. Um, and we can use the colon operator to do that, right? We can say, uh, the way that we would read this is for the idx is equal to 1 to idx is equal to 4. But it means exactly the same thing um, that we had done previously, right? It's still going to tick its way up through each one of these. All of these scripts will run exactly the same way um, if you actually run them. It's just different ways of, of defining them. So that's nice, right? We can use our colon operator to shrink that um, even more. Two more things that we can do to make this even better. We can abbreviate the for loop, um, even actually abbreviate the indexing uh, variable even more so that it goes to the end of x, so that it uh, always goes to the end of x. There are a couple of functions inside of MATLAB that allow you to calculate how big something is. It's not really a math operation, it's just counting how many rows and columns do I have on something like that? The four here, I don't want to have to count that every single time, right? If I update the number of positions here, right? If I say 40 and 50, I have to do a couple of annoying things that I don't like doing, which is I have to A, add enough zeros to keep it up, but now I have to recount how many elements that were there, right? I've added two more, so it's six. There is a function that will do that counting for you, um, and that function is length of the variable. Right, if you replace it with not just one to a number, but one to the length of however many elements you want, it'll just go that many. You can also replace it with a variable like n, right? If you set n to be 6, then it'll go 1 to n, and that means the same thing as 1 to 6. Um, so there are various things that you can put after the colon here, but we're working with plotting right here, so length of x um, is kind of helpful, right? It's a, it's a good way to have it set up. And then the last thing that we can do, now that we've sort of generalized x, is we can gen sorry, not generalized x, generalized the um, definition of our indexing variable here to just go over as many of the elements as we have. We can generalize x and y so that we don't have to actually type in all the numbers all at once. We've already seen how to generalize x with um, an existing function that we've already used. Um, so we're going to define x and y more generally. So we can take this same thing here. How do we do that? Well, I've already commented one of them, right? We can take 
um, X and replace it with a linspace command so that we don't have to really think about the individual points that we're evaluating at. We can just sort of say, I, I don't really care the values, just evaluate it from here to here in lots of steps so that I get a nice smooth looking curve. And so we would replace this with something like linspace 0 to 30, right, if that's the number that we wanted to, to go over. This would give us 100 points, and it would be a massive pain to have to type out 80 or 90 or 100 or however many zeros are, there are, and then even worse to count them, right? Because if you make a mistake, it's going to be wrong. There is a way to generate zeros in that particular way to ensure that you get the right number of zeros and in the right shape. Um, and it comes in two parts. First is a function called zeros. If you put a couple of numbers inside of the zeros function, it will give you either a vector or a matrix of all zeros in the particular shape that you want. So for example, if I want a vector that has one row and 13 columns, and I put zeros of 1, 13, I will get zeros for one row and 13 columns as I go. You can reverse it the other way, right? If it's 22 and 1, it'll give me 22 rows of zeros and one column of zeros. It can also be a matrix, which is something that we'll look at later. Um, so if I say zeros of 22 comma 5, that'll give me 22 rows of zeros and five columns of zeros um, altogether. So it's a nice pre-allocation thing, and we can couple that with another function called size. And all size does is calculate the size of a variable. Um, so it, it calculates the length and the width um, of whatever variable you're interested in. So for example, uh, size of x, the result of size of x will be the rows of x and the columns of x. Just the quantity of the rows and the columns of x. So we're taking essentially that result and putting it here inside of the zeros, and then the zeros is making that many rows of zeros and that many columns of zeros. So that's a pretty standard pre-allocation definition to say, I don't know what y is, but I know it's got to line up with x, right? It's got to have the same shape. Everything's got to sort of line up in the same um, place. So here we're performing a pre-allocation uh, of y to be zeros in the same shape. And when I say shape, I mean the same number of rows and columns as x. This stuff that we wrote here, right here, um, this is, uh, I don't know, it, I don't think anybody else really calls it that. Uh, it's the standard format or starting point for iteration, right? That particular set of lines, those lines 64. Let's actually define that. Lines 64 through 68 are the standard format or starting point for iteration. Usually our iterations will look something like that. The reason is it's flexible. If I want to change the way that I, or the range over which I'm plotting, I need to only change one number, right? If I want to go from 0 to 30, I do this. If I want to go from 0 to, I don't know, 0 0.2, that's okay, right? Everything else will update automatically um, and continue to work. I don't have to worry about recalculating a lot of stuff. Um, I've set it up in a flexible way that it auto-calculates the indexing parameters that I need. It set up y to be the right shape and the indexing um, variable here idx to be the right shape, um, or I should say to have the right um, behavior. That's the key. Um, and this is what we're going to come back to next week, and we're probably just going to spend like a week or two, probably two, maybe even three, um, doing stuff that requires us to do indexing. So please don't underestimate how important this is. Um, that pattern is going to come up a lot. And if you can, the, the more you can internalize that pattern of indexing and iteration, the easier it will be, and I say that with an asterisk, the easier it'll be to tackle the remaining problems. Not because the problems themselves will be easier, but you'll begin to think a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more about how to translate what you think ought to be done into code that behaves in that particular way. Um, and generally, we accomplish that through indexing. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, it is 
Friday. Um, I will see you back here on Monday. I am going to go read the patch notes that came out for Diablo 2 a little bit earlier today because I am pretty excited about that. Um, don't forget homework 2. You are good to go through at least problems 1 through 3. Um, we are going to more or less do problem 4 or parts of problem 4 on Monday. Um, so if you want to hang on, hold off on that one, um, we'll do a little bit more of that on, on Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Um, stay safe out there. Stay healthy. Um, and I look forward to seeing you back here on Monday. Have a good one. All.